up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Uh, okay. Anthropologists. Welcome to Anthropology. I'm Professor Ryan James. Um, I'm excited to be making this video series. This is not a format that I ever expected to teach in, but you know I'm happy to be doing it. I'm making the most of it, trying to have some fun with it. Uh, I've been a professor for about six years. Previously, I was a TA for 14 years. And before that, I was an undergraduate student, of course, and the first class that I took was Intro to Anthropology. Um, I had no idea at the time what anthropology was. I didn't really care what it was because I just took the class because it fit my schedule, which is the same reason why many people take courses. Um, but as it turned out, I had a great instructor. I had some great classmates. Everything just fell into place. And now here I am, 18 years later, teaching this class online for the first time, but in total, this is my, I think, 10th or 11th time teaching this. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing it again in this new, this new format. Uh, I like anthropology because it's, I think, a useful way of, of thinking about and piecing together really everything that's happened on the planet over the past 528 years in particular, that's the focus of, of this course, um, how our own lives fit into that, and ideally, how to change some of it and make some aspects of it better, and I'm going to share with you that approach, some of those insights throughout this video series. So to start, um, you know, the title of this part of the course is What is Anthropology? So what is anthropology? Uh, a lot of people think what anthropology is, is... Um, Digging up bones, solving crimes, um, that is what some anthropologists do. Uh, it's not my specialty at all, and it's not part of this course. Um, the kind of anthropology that I do and that this course focuses on is a social science that studies culture. So let's start by defining culture. Um, this won't cover the whole thing, but here's our working definition just to start in this first part of the lecture series. We can think about culture as a system of meaning shared by a group of people. So it's not something an individual can just make up. Um, it's not random. It's a system that people use to understand what's happening around them and how they fit into it. Um, culture is usually a unconscious and taken for granted reality. For example, if you uh, try to rewind your memory a couple of months before the coronavirus crisis, which I know feels like a lifetime ago at this point, but think back to, you know, right up until mid-March or so. Um, think of some of the etiquette on public transit. So maybe you could say it's part of the culture of Toronto and its suburbs to sit down on a crowded bus beside somebody or between two people, strangers, just sit with them and not acknowledge them. Um, now, when you did that, you probably weren't thinking, I'm doing this because it's my culture. You just do it. It's unconscious. It's taken for granted. It's just normal to you. Um, by comparison, I've been to cities where people ask permission to do that sometimes, not always, but I saw it happen enough that maybe it's part of the culture of the place to, you know, ask strangers permission to sit beside them. Um, and maybe that's an example of a cultural difference, a bit of a mundane one. Um, the examples get more exciting and more, you know, interesting as we go, but just to get us started, um, you know, with one little example of how culture is like this kind of roadmap or, or guideline that operates in the background of these minute details of, of everyday life. That's one thing culture is. Uh, some other things that culture includes are standards um, that people use to judge actions. So every culture has some sense of what's right and wrong, and those standards can be very different from place to place, from culture to culture. So throughout this series, we'll be talking, um, one thing we'll talk about are some of the problems that come up when you try to judge something from another culture by the standards of your own. Um, I also want to add that even within the same culture, of course, people can disagree on those standards, and of course those standards change over time. So another point we'll get into as the course goes on are the problems that come up when we assume that cultures are static or homogenous. So if we assume that they stay the same, that the standards stay the same, um, or if we assume that 
you know, everybody within that culture shares the exact same worldview and standards. It's not that simple, um, but there's often some shared sense of what's right or wrong to at least some extent. So we add all of this up, and culture is the ways the groups of people live um, worldwide. People live in very different ways, but it's also important to note, I think, that those differences aren't often as big as they seem at first. Um, and that's something else we'll come back to throughout this this lecture series. So now you know what anthropologists think culture is, and that idea is really the foundation of sociocultural anthropology, which is one of the four major types of anthropology that we call the four fields, and it's the one that this course is, is focused on. So let me talk for a bit about the four fields that we don't cover. Um, the first one is physical anthropology. That includes the study of human evolution and forensic anthropology. That's the digging up bones and solving murders that many people think many anthropologists do. And some anthropologists do indeed do that, but I don't, so it's not a part of the course. And um, I'm sorry for that, I guess. Um, all right, next of the four fields, archaeology. Uh, the study of remains and artifacts to learn about ancient societies. Not much of that here either. Um... Next one is linguistics, a.k.a. the study of language. And we do indeed do a little bit of that in this course. It's not the main focus, but it does come up. Um, linguistics often look at how it looks at how language is dynamic. It's creative. It's always changing. And one example of that that might be a bit familiar to some of you is this article on um, it's called a note on man's in Toronto. So some of you already know this. But apparently young people in Toronto and its surroundings have created their own pronoun, the pronoun man's. So lately the man's pronoun can mean I or they or us or really anybody. Uh, 20 years ago, I remember most of the time it meant either they or us. Anyway, it, it comes out as something that linguists call multi-ethnic adolescent Toronto English, which is largely but not entirely based on Jamaican Patois um, and they compare this to what they call multicultural London English, or in other words, how youth in London, England speak. So apparently in London, England, they say man with no S on the end instead of mans, and it means basically the same thing. So why do youth in London say man, and why do youth in Toronto say mans? And in both cases, when do those same youth say, you know, I, instead of using the slang pronoun? Well... So like I said, that study is from the field of linguistics, which isn't really our specialty, but the question that I asked about it is the kind of question that a sociocultural anthropologist would be interested in. As for the answers to that question, well, the answers, I think, lie in histories of colonialism, of migration, as well as the media, music, popular culture, youth subcultures, experiences with racism, other forms of discrimination, all of which we'll talk about a lot through the next 23 episodes after this one, which brings me to the kind of anthropology that this series is indeed focused on, and that's sociocultural anthropology, which I promise is a lot more exciting than it sounds. We're just getting started. Sociocultural anthropology looks at how societies are structured, um, how cultural meanings are created. The main research method, the way we do this, is field work. So to understand how society is structured and how cultural meanings are created, you live among the people you're studying, you take part in their everyday lives, you talk to them, ideally for a year or two at a time. Uh, one very minor point, just for clarity, uh, th this kind of anthropology is usually called social anthropology in the UK and cultural anthropology in the USA, but they mean mostly the same thing. So in typical Canadian fashion, instead of coming up with our own term, we mix these two into sociocultural anthropology. But really the, the difference doesn't matter and you can use these terms interchangeably. I'm just saying this to clarify in case you see one in a textbook and the other in an article, they mean the same thing. The difference for our purposes doesn't really matter a whole lot. Next thing I wanna show you is uh, three points that really any sociocultural anthropologist working today would use as a starting point for their research, just to give you a sense of what anthropologists look for when doing research um, and what the overall point of that research is. First one is the idea of cultural relativism, which basically says there's no use in 
judging beliefs or behaviors that are different from your own. It's, it's a better project. It's a more worthwhile pursuit to try to understand them on their own terms. Now, cultural relativism is not a perfect idea itself, but it's a pretty good starting point um, for understanding why people do what they do. And I do think it holds up in most situations, but we'll talk about some limitations to this approach later on in, in the course that anthropologists have encountered in their, in their research. Um, I also want to say it's, it's one of those ideas that you often see misrepresented in our current poisonous and very polarized political climate. Um, sometimes when you see the concept of relativism discussed in the media or on, I don't know, podcasts or something, it often gets simplified and distorted um, as if it is saying that, you know, anything goes and that we need to approve of everything we see. Uh, that's not what cultural relativism, um, that's not what the concept was, was, was meant to say. It's meant to be a starting point for a legitimate understanding for why people do what they do. And again, we'll talk about some of the complications a bit later on. Um, the second point that all anthropologists working today, well, most anyway, would agree with is uh, this approach to social inequality. We, we all know that we live in a very inequitable world. Um, but most anthropologists would tell you that that wasn't natural, it's not normal, or it's not, it, it wasn't inevitable. There's other ways that things could have gone and other ways they, they could still go, I guess. Um, third point, what we see around us now is not necessarily the result of progress. Now, obviously, it's a result of time passing, but things don't always change for the better, and this isn't the only way that things could have turned out. So I think that third point um, might seem radical to some, but I think it becomes a bit less and less controversial every time a scary new climate change report comes out. And worldwide, there's this growing sense, I think, that the way that we've interacted with nature since the beginnings of industrial capitalism, maybe that's not really progress. Um, and these ideas are what inform, I think, some of the more radical thinkers who are now saying that, once this current pandemic passes the crisis point and leads us to some kind of new normal, perhaps, that maybe we shouldn't go back to the old normal, um, that we should create something new entirely because the old normal wasn't actually working very well. Um, but all that aside, I still think it's a very powerful belief in our society and in many other societies that contemporary Western society has figured out the best way to be human. And we're just getting better and better at it as time goes on. It's, it's a common assumption. It's a very powerful idea. It's an idea that anthropologists like to, like to challenge. Also on the subject of challenging problematic old ideas, uh, an important point that I'm going to address right away here in this first video and come back to a lot throughout the rest of the series is the history of racism in anthropology. So in the early history of anthropology, 1800s, much of the research was done um, to justify colonialism. So at that point, anthropology was mostly about European researchers studying indigenous peoples. They would judge people by European standards, call them things like uncivilized or simple or primitive because their standards for living were different from European ones. And that, that research, that data was often used to justify colonial policies. Uh, that started to change within anthropology in the late 1800s, and nowadays most anthropologists approach their work through a cultural relativist lens and thoroughly renounce this, this old history of, of racist anthropology, but of course it's not, not that simple. So there's lots more to all of this, which we'll talk about as the course goes on. But just to summarize for this first day, anthropology began as a flawed, racist approach to studying human difference. That began to change in the late 1800s, and anthropologists were among some of the key thinkers and researchers who fought against racism in science through the 20th century and started to argue that all humans are equally, equally evolved and part of the same species. But that colonial past, that legacy, doesn't just go away. Um, so like I said, it's not that simple. But in 2020, all of the official associations in anthropology are, of course, opposed to racist ideologies. And many anthropologists are, you know, professionally as well as personally committed to, to decolonizing the, the discipline. So like I said a few minutes ago, um, we live in a very inequitable world. Wealth is concentrated among very few people. Uh, North American and Western European culture, um, we often say it's hegemonic, which means it's treated as, as the norm. And 
other cultures worldwide are are pressured to emulate it. So throughout this course, we'll be looking at how conflicts and how the spread of the capitalist mode of production have displaced people from their territory and also at how people manage to survive displacement by being creative, by sticking together, and by resisting. So the image on the slide, that's a picture of someone from North Sentinel Island. It's an island off the coast of India that's often described as being completely isolated from the outside world. So the person in that slide is aiming an arrow at the helicopter from which the picture was taken and that's how people on that island tend to react to outsiders showing up on their territory so we'll talk some more about that in the next episode as well um, in the meantime here are some other examples of uh, cases that we'll look at throughout this video series um, now on the screen that's an image of the Arawak the indigenous people that Columbus and his crew met when they landed by accident in the Bahamas in 1492 we'll talk some more about that next episode um this image now we have indigenous people in quebec whose land was almost taken from them in 1990 so that a nearby golf course could be expanded so we'll talk about that um a few episodes from now but the image on the slide that, that's a mohawk warrior and a canadian soldier staring each other down during that conflict which was front page news internationally all through the summer of 1990 um, here we have an image of some farmers in Jamaica who had been basically put out of business by international trade policies that, on paper anyway, were supposed to, to benefit their, their national economy. Um, and towards the end of the video series, we'll learn about a low-income community in Chicago where people are worried they'll be forced out of their neighborhood when housing gets too expensive for them to live there through the process of gentrification, which we'll talk more about later on in the series. That's part of a, a unit on urban anthropology, which is my specialty as a researcher. So just to repeat two of our core ideas, we live in a very inequitable world, but that's not natural, normal, it wasn't inevitable. And what we see around us is not necessarily the result of progress. And this is one of my favorite examples of how the spread of Western capitalism to much of the world is not necessarily the same thing as progress. So in 1968, an anthropologist named Marshall Salins argued that hunter-gatherers were likely the, quote, original affluent society. So for thousands of years of human history, people made a living by hunting animals, gathering crops, sharing what they got within their, their communities. Um, hunting and gathering came before agriculture, uh, long before societies had states, um, before there were laws that were written down. And today there still are people who hunt and gather. That's still a mode of production that people you know live, live with, but they're usually under intense pressure to, to give that up and become part of the capitalist economy. And again, we'll look at this in more detail later in the course, but the point for now is that Marshall Salins, the anthropologist who did this study, found that hunter-gatherers kept themselves safe, sheltered, and fed by working four or five hours a day on average. So among the ways that human beings um, make a living, hunting and gathering came first. So because of that, hunter-gatherers were once seen as the most primitive or, or the most underdeveloped type of society um but on average they work a lot less than people in so-called advanced societies and so as a result marshall salins found they tend to be healthier and happier so often when i make that point the first thing people ask me is so what are you saying you want to be a hunter-gatherer and no the, the point is it's not about picking and choosing or like choosing sides or which one's better um, I'm not built for hunting and gathering. I grew up in Toronto um, in a capitalist society. So if I tried to hunt and gather for a living, I think, you know, my allergies would probably kill me before the starvation would. So no, I don't want to just trade my life for a hunting and gathering lifestyle. The point is just to think more critically about progress. So compare the amount of time that hunter gatherers spend working to what capitalism has given us so far. Um, so, you know, during the Industrial Revolution about 200 years ago, one of the promises was that one day capitalism and technology would eventually give us a 15-hour work week. That was a, the great hope of 200 years ago. So as you know, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and meanwhile, there's lots written that we'll look at later on in this course about how technology is arguably instead creating more stress, more pressure, and in fact, more useless work. 
So just think about what progress really means, who really has a better life, and, and by what standard. Meanwhile, here's one of my favorite anthropologists, David Graeber, um, interviewed in the Guardian newspaper a few years ago, talking about how most of us in North America and Europe apparently have what he calls, quote, bullshit jobs. So what he says is, um, I'll read you a quote from the article. He says, huge swaths of people spend their entire working lives performing tasks they secretly believe do not really need to be performed. The moral and spiritual damage that comes from this situation is profound. It is a scar across our collective soul, yet virtually no one talks about it. So we'll talk some more about that as well later on in this series. Last thing for today is a more detailed preview of, uh, of this lecture series. The whole thing is divided into four parts. Um, the first part, which we of course have just started today, is called What is Anthropology? So by the end of it, you'll know where anthropology comes from, how the methods that anthropologists use make it different from other social sciences, and a bit about how anthropology has changed over the centuries. Part two of the course is called Identity and Inequality. We'll be looking at how the things that make up a person's identity, things like ethnicity, gender, religion, class, how those things also structure patterns of inequality both here in Canada and at a global scale. So on that slide is the cover of one of the books that we'll discuss, which takes an anthropological approach to the study of Canadian multiculturalism. Uh, part three, I think, is the most fun part of the course. It's called Systemic Processes, Everyday Lives. We'll be looking in depth at the craft of ethnography. So in ethnography, just to preview this, it is a book that's written by an anthropologist about the year or two that they spent doing field work. And then part four, the final part of the course, is called Anthropology Today. As the title suggests, it's a brief kind of overview, little preview of some of the more popular specializations of anthropology today. Um, the anthropology of the media, the anthropology of tourism, medical anthropology, and visual anthropology. And then we wrap up the course with the controversial topic of the so-called Anthropocene. So what is that? Is it really a legit geological era? Is it a catchphrase? Is it yet another Eurocentric construction? We'll talk all about those debates and um, those controversies in episode 24, which will be quite a while from now, it feels like. But we're just getting started. Um, so you can also consider that last part of the course. That's, that's like a preview of what an anthropology major would look like. Um, because there are upper year courses that look more in depth at, at each of those those topics. So the last thing for today is I'll give you a, a short range preview of the stuff we'll cover in the next couple of episodes. Next episode, I'm going to add a lot more detail to what I said today on where anthropology came from. Uh, I will also review the early history of anthropology, which is quite ugly and embarrassing at times, but it's still with us in some important ways. Um, in episode three, we'll focus on the research methods used by anthropologists. We will look at um, what we can learn from qualitative research methods, what some of the limitations are, and we'll learn about one of the biggest controversies in the history of anthropology. Um, a point that I want to wrap with, though, is that we don't just study so-called other people. And on that note, um, anytime you are tempted to talk about other people, try to avoid doing so because other is one of those problem terms in anthropology so every time you see other in an article it often has scare quotes on it or when anthropologists say the word they they do the hand quotes other so i might not do that every time in the video because it gets kind of annoying but you get the point it's a problematic concept thinking about groups of people as as others um anyway we don't just study so-called other people we also study ourselves and our own societies and i'll get into that a little bit in the third episode of, of this series um because, of course, we have culture here, too. And by here, I mean wherever you're at, your own context, there's culture happening there as well. And we will look at some examples of anthropologists studying their own cultures, also how other cultures see their own cultures, which is the focus of one of the readings for, for that week, um, for that episode, rather. Um, so on top of all that, most anthropologists would also tell you that there's not really any clear line between different cultures. And so it doesn't make sense to talk about us and them as if we're like two different things. But more on that in the next couple of episodes. 
Last thing for today, um, I just want to make some acknowledgments, some thank yous. I want to thank The Muse, my good friend The Muse, who may or may not be watching this at some point, for the music that he contributed. He gave us the intro and the outro music, my very talented friend The Muse. Thank you, The Muse. And uh, thank you to my daughter, Nia James O'Connor, my 12-year-old daughter, who put together the intro video that starts off these these episodes and also helps with the editing. Um, so thank you, Nia. And uh, all right. That's, that's enough for today. Thank you.